addressing a different aspect. Um, we have one presentation which relates to the, some international work on, on telehealth and medicine, um, uh, a national overview, and a, a local perspective as well. And the, the three speakers, um, two of them will be known to almost all of you, Stephen Jennison, who is head of the Department of Medicine and a cardiologist, Roy Davidson, who works in the IT department, and uh, the third person who um, you won't know, or I don't believe any of you will know, um, is John Garrett, who is joining us by, by a link from Christchurch. John is chair of the New Zealand Telehealth Group and a paediatrician in Christchurch and also on the West Coast. And it is possible that some of you will know him from his time here before as a paediatric registrar. So the, the, the three um, will be given presentations and guys happy to take questions after your individual slots. It's probably best. Very good. Okay. Oh, probably uh, no. the end. At the end? Yeah. Okay, questions at the end if you can save them up. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> Welcome, everybody. It's uh, my privilege to uh, be part of a threesome in terms of discussing telehealth. Um, I would like you to think of three words oh, that. Uh, on, Dr. Hammer is also working the lights this today. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to uh, mention three words that um, pivot around the uh, that pivot around the national. Uh, the, <laughs> maybe well, can we start by switching off the microphones of those people in the remote? Thank you so much. Uh, and Stephen, Stephen, hey, John, would you be able to just say a few words and, and say hi just so we can get you on the picture? Very happy to, and uh, nice to meet you all uh, again. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. So the three words I want relating to the health service plan is access, communication, and healthcare patient relationship are the three things that I want you to think about as we go through this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking initially about some work that was done in the setting of heart failure. And uh, for those of you who don't work in medicine, this is the classic depiction of uh, a condition that leads to fluid retention, shortness of breath, and has a high mortality. And if we look at uh, Northland DHB and look at our readmission rates, readmission rates here on the right, you'll see that COPD at 29% readmission rate at 30 days, and here, heart failure and shock has a 27% readmission rate at 30 days. This is a malignant condition that people die from. What I want to share with you is uh, some work that uh, I, I was involved in in the United States uh, around the, the use of telehealth in looking after patients with acute and severe heart failure. And this research was sponsored by a HRSA grant, a federal grant that I'll mention later. The data that I'm going to describe to you is set against a backdrop of a multidisciplinary heart failure team that involves five heart failure nurses, a dietitian, a pharmacist, an exercise physiologist, a respiratory therapist, a massage therapist, a music therapist, and a counselor. I know you will all think because this is America that these, this is all funded by some wonderful federal agency and I'm here to tell you it took 10 years to create this team, and that people all do it in a volunteer capacity. They have gainful jobs at this institution, but they do not get paid for uh, any, in any other role than being their pharmacist for patients in general. So this is not um, something that's extra special. It comes about by people enjoying working the professional liaison together. So for a patient that had acute heart failure, was seen in the hospital to home clinic, a little like what we have here, and from the hospital to home clinic was set up with, uh, after an assessment of, by the, the pharmacist, looking at med reconciliation, by the heart failure nurse, by a review by the dietitian to make sure that they're adhering to a low sodium diet and they have an understanding of what that involves. They would have completed their advanced directives, they've been screened for depression, and they will have had the appropriate uh, lab testing. After that follow-up clinic review, they were then randomized in the study onto a scale. And this is a Cardiacom scale, which is a, uh, something that you can stand on here. It weighs accurately to within a tenth of a pound. It's plugged into their landline. 
uh, when we initially started the study, but as time rolled out and more and more patients had only cell phones, there became a 3G component as well. So the notion was that for 90 days after the study, the patients would take the scale home with them, it talks with them, it's in braille at the top, it asks them a series of questions, they then weigh themselves, and then that data is transmitted back to a central command. We started off uh, in uh, Springfield, Illinois, not the home of the Simpsons, and then disseminated the study gradually over the next 18 months. We enrolled a grand total of 844 patients, 459 of which were male, the average or mean age was 70. Some patients had uh, various devices in as well, such as CRT or pacemakers or defibrillators. And as this study is now being submitted for publication, we've only got 46 more follow-up studies to do, but the patients were followed up at 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days. We lost 66 patients, 7.8% of the patients. And we had a death rate of 3.67% during the 90-day period. Only a small number were lost to follow up. What we did see was a dramatic reduction in the number of emergency room visits, both at 31 days, 60 days, and 90 days. And in terms of 30-day unscheduled readmissions, 12.9% uh, of uh, there were unscheduled readmissions over the three-year period. At the terms of um, mortality, as I've said, 0.08% over the three years. Total mortality for the study was 3.67%. So the lessons we learned from this that heart failure patients are more brittle than others. If you give them a device that reports by exception, that is to say that each day the patient would step onto the device, the device would ask them questions, are you taking your medicine, are you following a low sodium diet, are you feeling more short of breath? and then they would weigh the patient and they would be transmitted. When I say reporting by exception, it means that of these 844 patients, if patients weren't having symptoms, then there's no red flag goes up, so the heart failure nurse does not get involved with the management of that patient on that day. Okay, reporting by exception. Non-compliant people learn that the importance of taking the medicines and then following a low sodium diet is important. They very quickly get feedback from looking at their own weights to see if they sodium load, if they were to have a Vegemite sandwich, not that they would in Illinois, but if they, I'm giving you a local example, if they went down to the Chinese, got a sodium load going, fluid retention, weight gain. It cost uh, $1,097 per patient for the 90 days that they were on telehealth, including the rental of the scale and staff expenses. Any hospitalization at St. John's Hospital where this data was uh, performed in 2012, a hospitalization cost $10,472. I believe our heart failure cost here in Northland is approximately $3,200, $3,400, so that gives you a kind of a comparable number. And at St. John's there were a total of 842 admissions for heart failure. And I've already shown you that here at Fungaray what a high readmission rate we have for heart failure. Now, that's a piece of telehealth data. I want to thank the institution for allowing me and funding me to go by my CLE to the success and failure in telehealth meeting in Australia. And I wanted to share that data with you, uh, some of the things that I came across. This is, uh, at, was at Brisbane, and as you know, the Australians have been practicing quite aggressive telehealth for a long period of time. And I've just put up here the sessions that we're running to give you a flavor of what's going on. Telehealth service <coughs> delivery and pediatric acute care. Palliative care by video consultation. Uh, teleaudiolo teleaudiology increases current workforce capacity. Telemedicine, are we at the tipping point? Uh, telemedicine for the clinical management of diabetes using video conferencing to improve access to and quality of interpreter services during specialist consultations. Um, building communi community capacity to tap into telehealth. There's a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight. So this was one paper that came out of the University of Queensland regarding the institution 
of a telehealth program? Why are change management practices important to telehealth implementations? And they made a big emphasis about the importance of a workforce alignment and an operational effectiveness. I want to tell you that I heard Cameron made a remark about the latest technology in telehealth. The message that comes across time and time and time again from all these presentations is that it's not really the technology that's making this happen. It's the organization of the processes and systems of which telehealth can facilitate that. It's not the telehealth. It's not some rocket science that's happening. It's us as healthcare providers that need to understand that this is a potential extension of the way that we practice medicine, and that's the point of my delivery here today. They concluded that uh, uh, change management practices should be considered and incorporated before and after telehealth implementation. It's not just a case of, hey, you can use the telehealth room today. It's a question of, as an organization and as a department, understanding the potential that telehealth can have. But you've got to have it up front, and then you've got to have it after. The learning successes. Uh, list types of service events, break down service event and identity telehealth. Identify the benefits that you're planning for your particular service that you're going to be offering. This is uh, an example of, uh, in one institution in Queensland, how the number of telehealth consultations sp took off. January, March, April, June, July, September, October, December 2013. You can see scheduled conversations, um, webinars, educational opportunities for staff, how it all took off. And you see the kind of geographical challenges that in Queensland they have to reach to these various folks. But I don't want you to think that it's all just about geography. There's more to it than that. New ways to develop relationships between the IT department and the clinicians is absolutely paramount. They have a dedicated working team that's liaising technical issues with practical issues. Things not to be forgotten. Here was another talk about uh, telehealth. Much to offer, but still a long way to go. And in this, it was the infectious disease people who reviewed 120 consultations for things like hepatitis, HIV, uh, uh, latent TB, hepatitis B, and they used a, a, a variety of techniques, phone, video, in-person, family, GP, and they looked at this in terms of a, a practicality. 29 GPs were involved in this study. They looked at using Skype, they looked at using GoToMeeting, they had IT issues of sound, echo, software, etc. that cropped up in the first few consultations. But then as time went by, the number of <coughs> hiccups got less and less. Patients were found to love it, better communication with GPs, saves travel. The median return trip of 494 kilometers was avoided. They calculated that they saved 54,000 kilometers of travel by using technology, and uh, they were also concerned about the old carbon footprint, and uh, even put that into their calculation. Again, allocate sufficient administrative support staff, component of overall patient care. Move to a standard system, standardizing within your institution what are acceptable standards for telehealth. Another talk was on pediatric palliative care video consultation. So this is the challenging issue of pediatric oncology, uh, kids and families with malignant illnesses that we're looking for end-stage treatment for. Um, and they looked at a cost evaluation of using telehealth so that we could do home telehealth from the institution, from the hospital. Uh, in Queensland, uh, the specialist pediatric tertiary services are only available in Brisbane. And you'll understand because of the geographical mass that's involved that there's a lot of children and families that need support. They rely on hospital supports. They want to be cared for at home. Many of these are end-stage malignant conditions that they've got. They're an extremely vulnerable population, both at the patient level and at the family level. They hoped that the telehealth program would provide an extra layer of support rather than take over care. It would support the primary care physicians. You can imagine a patient with some complex malignancy on complex um, pharmacological agents, uh, chemotherapy. The primary care physicians are probably pretty intimidated by that. They used their video conferencing to provide support 
for patient and healthcare professionals. They, look at, they looked at 95 actual home telehealth consultations over 24 months. They did a cost breakdown and they compared in their model home telehealth versus family travel to hospital versus home visit from the palliative care service. Again, the geographical challenges, travel by road, travel by air, costs that go with that. They looked at fixed costs, variable costs in terms of technology. I should point out that for the telehealth population, the cost for the 95 consultations was 12,124. If they applied the model to outpatient consultations, 71,025. And if they compared a model of home visits, 103,675 significant cost savings are possible. And they concluded, based on the activity undertaken over a 24-month period, that there were significant savings in health, in health service costs, but additionally it provided practical benefits to families, healthcare workers and clinicians in a very difficult, challenging area. There was another presentation uh, that I think is also of interest, looking at MITI Australia, a web-based multimodal therapy for children and adolescents with cerebral palsy. This was a very animated uh, discussion with video presentations and everything that went on. But there's a, there's a principle here that I'm, I'm trying to get across to you. Uh, cerebral palsy kids, as you may be aware, one in three cannot walk, three in four are in pain, one in three have hip displacement, one in four have behavior disorders. 1 in 5 drool, 1 in 10 are blind, 1 in 15 are tube fed, 1 in 25 are deaf. I mean, to put these children through any form of therapy with the geographical distances that they have, you can understand that these are huge, huge hurdles. Tremendous amount of suffering both for the patient and the family in trying to make that happen. And again, if you've got the expertise in Brisbane, that you've got all these patients coming from the outback, how are you going to be able to provide a service? This is one example of how they did that. Now the concept that is evolving more and more, that if we engage the brain's plasticity to drive beneficial changes, then training uh, can be very effective, but it must be intensive, rep repetitive, and progressively challenging. In order to do that in someone who's 500 or 1,000 Ks away becomes a challenge. What I'd like to show you here is some of the models that they have been using uh, they have the parents, by using the MITI model, which is transferred over video conferencing, the patients can still work. Uh, obviously, it goes to the individual patient in their home. It gets around some issues of inequity of access. Uh, and, of course, how big should the therapy bill be in terms of whether the patients come to the institution or whether you try and beam into them. So the MITI program is a program that you can use with various games that the kids play for a set period of time. And in the data that they presented, it was a multimodal web-based training program and looked at cognitive upper limb and physical activity training. Um, it was very impressive to see the tremendous changes that they were able to do by beaming into their home, rather than saying, spin the bottle. If they live a thousand miles away, then it's, it's pretty tough. I must make sure that I give cognizance and tr uh, credence to um, uh, Helena Elsass, who actually set up this program, and as you may be aware, it's been published in the BMJ. There was a video that showed this uh, little girl in action interacting with the video conferencing equipment, and there we go. So she wears, in this case, she wears little fluorescent bands on her arms and her head, and then in, in order to play the game, she has to do certain movements. I, no, the PTs and OTs are all very familiar with this. Here's the BMJ uh, article that was published. And they looked at outcomes from a physiotherapy point of view. They presented a case, Phyllis Proudlove, a 14-year-old with left-sided hemiplegia, who had access, and this is a, a plot of the daily access that they had to this program that was set up by video conferencing, looked at the improvement in occupational performance, upper limb and visual perception, manual dexterity, neuropsychology, very impressive. But here's the thing. How many of the registrars have this technology in, at home? Oh, come on. Yes, thank you. Sorry, what did I say? <laughs> We're talking about this Connect. You've got obviously kids of the right age. The, the point I'm trying to make is that this, the program itself, 
is all on the, on the disk. The technology we've actually had for the last four or five years. This is not waiting for the IT to do it. It's all about the processes and the systems to make it happen. And that really is my real strong takeover message. So in this particular case, in the realm of cerebral palsy, MITI offers a novel therapy approach, regular therapy accessible for children in regional and rural areas. Clinical change is observed in individual children yet to be completed, and then they did the statistical analysis. Very much a positive feedback from the family. So as I introduced this talk, you know, I talked about the notion of access, the notion of communication, and the relationship between the healthcare provider and the physician. I'm here, as I conclude, just to suggest that these are technologies that we can embrace. Do not think that we have to wait for Roy Davidson to come up with some magic new trick from an iPad before it happens. The technology is here, and that was the, really the kind of big take-home message for me uh, from this. The last thing I will just mention, here is uh, uh, patients with Parkinson's disease living in a non-metropolitan area. Uh, they are limited and struggle with dysarthria, reduced quality of life. These kind of patients, again, just like the cerebral palsy children, need intensive regular training. And so what they did is they, in this particular presentation, looked at a, 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 an approach called the LSVT lab mode. This is a way of helping patients that have got Parkinson's disease, may have had a laryngectomy, swallowing difficulties. This is the way of getting to them in their home situation. This is a now the gentleman with his little, it comes in a suitcase, it flips up, and it's something that he can do on a daily basis, feedback to the, the PT and the OT. They gave us the results, which were all very uh, encouraging, and was very receptive. So at this point in time, I'd like to say that from the international perspective, whether it's a heart failure study in the US, or whether it's uh, the uh, success and failure teleconference, the technology should not limit what we do. And I'd like to hand over now to John, who will give you um, his perspective uh, from a national viewpoint. Thank you. John, can we get you to um, say something so that you come onto the screen? That's fantastic. And John, we hang on just a second. Um, we're just sorting out the microphone and, and the volume at this end. Can I just ask the people at the other yeah. remote sites to turn down their microphones or mute them so mute that them. they don't interfere? Thank you. <coughs> um, can you let me know when you're, uh, when you're all set there? Yep, we're all good to go. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. So can you see, can you guys see that um, first of my slides and can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. Right. Um, thanks, um, Stephen. That's, that was really interesting, and, and Roy for asking me to have a chat. And I suppose what I want to talk to you guys about today is um, uh, what happens uh, between Canterbury and the West Coast in terms of telemedicine. Just um, to give you an idea that Northland's not the only uh, place underway. We, um, uh, you can see, we've got some PowerPoint slide backgrounds and a sign, so uh, we're pretty advanced here at Canterbury and the Coast. After that, I want to briefly mention some of the, um, a couple of specific things that we're doing in the background um, in Canterbury to, to see whether we can push telemedicine along a bit further, because it's still got a long way to go. And then if I have time, and Roy has um, limited my time very sensibly, um, I'll talk to you about the New Zealand Telehealth Forum. So on the West Coast, and I, I've got a joint appointment between Canterbury and the West Coast DHBs as the paediatrician and an equal responsibility to both. But I live here in, in Christchurch. There's 6,500 children out of a population of 32,000. And you can see 3,000 of them go to ED a year, 400 of them get admitted. Um, we're seeing 1,100 kids and outpatients, and then there's about 350 births. And some of the kids get a bit sick and they get transferred um, off the coast, but not that many, five or 10 kids and 15 to 20, sometimes 25 neonates. So the, the people on the coast get their health service delivered um, in a number of different ways, like everywhere, but um, on this map, all the big crosses are the hospitals. So there's Reefton, which in fact is a uh, almost an aged care facility. Uh, Westport, which is um, slightly bigger, bigger so that um, it's got doctors who work there. They're the local GPs. 
And then down Greymouth, um, the main centre. Um, so we're big enough to have a paediatric inpatient ward, um, a critical care unit, a delivery suite, x-ray and CT, that kind of stuff. All the other crosses are where the rural uh, clinics are along the coast. Um, and I guess the, um, the fundamental thing about the paediatric service on the coast is that um, from the point of view of the patients, they don't get to meet a paediatrician when they're unwell um, acutely. Um, and they get to meet any one of a number of other people. So um, um, they get to meet a rural nurse specialist in the rural clinics. They might, if they go to Greymouth Hospital and get admitted, they might be admitted there under um, a physician. And that may or may not scare any of you physicians in the room, but um, Paul Holt um, still does look after children. Um, and then in Greymouth, there are um, there now four rural hospital medicine doctors who provide the inpatient SMO level cover for children. Um, there's also the GPs in, in Westport, so if you turn up to Westport to the hospital, you get seen by a GP. Um, to give you an idea of, of what it's like on the coast, if you set off today from Whangarei and drove south, by the time you got to Bulls, you would have got to the bottom of the west coast. So uh, it's a it's a small DHB by population, but a huge DHB by area. And um, you know, there's uh, on this map about six DHBs in that um, length of the country. Um, so um, for the acute stuff, what we feel in Canterbury is that I guess we've got an obligation to provide um, support to the non. Um, specialists who are looking after the children on the coast when they're unwell. And that's our responsibility, and it's our res responsibility to figure out how to do it well. For the non-acute stuff, the outpatient stuff, the kids do get seen by a paediatrician because I go to the coast every two weeks for clinics, but um, the number of clinics we can do is defined by uh, those visits every two weeks. And um, the demand for um, kids to be seen in outpatients exceeds that supply, if you like. So um, um, we uh, had um, quite long waiting lists. The other thing about the coast is that it can be um, uh, isolated from the rest of the country. So um, every year, um, Arthur's Pass gets closed for a few days by um, snow. That The white stuff on the ground there is snow, if you're not familiar. Um, <laughs> And um, about 50 days a year, there's some time in that day where you can't fly on or off the coast. And then within the coast itself, there are um, troubles with transport. So roads get um, blocked or washed away, that kind of thing. And so the services on the coast have got to have a relative degree of independence for at least some period of time. So um, what we um, did uh, probably about three, three and a half years ago now is try and add something into the way we were supporting the coast from Canterbury, and that was to add in telemedicine. So now all the places on this map, same as before, that have stayed red are places with uh, video conference capacity. And um, the coast have got, I think, 35 or 36 video conference units now, uh, which is about the same number as we have in total in Canterbury. Um, the places that don't have a unit are either, um, uh, don't have any um, broadband access or are extremely small places. And what we've got on my desk here in front of me is this very expensive, very high quality unit. And then in the rural clinics, we've given those guys these cheap, um, <laughs> actually they're not low quality units, they're, they're very good, but they're, they've got a fixed camera on the top, so it just points in the one direction, you can't uh, move around, you can't zoom in or out. In the hospitals on the coast, um, we've got more expensive units, like the one that you're looking at now with the pan to zoom camera on the top and that camera controlled from the far end. Then in Greymouth Hospital, because there's the inpatient ward, the ED, the delivery suite, um, and the critical care, um, we've got a mobile unit. It's got wheels, a battery, and it's wireless, so it could be pointed to any bed space in the hospital um, and any kid who might be in the hospital. The acute stuff um, we found after a while wasn't just happening in the daytime, and so um, uh, because it was unlikely that I would come home, uh, come from home back to work after hours, we've also got a way of me joining this um, uh, video conference network from home, and so that's 
uh, through a laptop or an iPad or something on um, via the normal internet into uh, what is otherwise a closed network that we do our video conferencing on. Um, just before we leave this slide, um, can you guys see where Fotorama is um, down there? So down towards about two thirds of the way down the coast, there's a wee town called Fotorama. Remember where that is, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, but I'm going to show you a few pictures now of, of some of these places. So uh, this is the emergency department in Buller Hospital in Westport. You get to see the whole thing in the one picture. Um, in fact, there is a second bed just off to the to the left. Um, and in the middle, you can see the video conference unit that they wheel into that room um, that I can dial into if they've got a kid in the ED there that they want to show me and talk about. Down in um, Grandmouth, if um, there was a kid in the paediatric ward, um, this is what I would see from home if I was looking at the um, treatment room in the paediatric ward. And so uh, the baby on the bed, the resuscitation trolley on the left. Um, okay, you late. <laughs> um, and then um, equipment around the room and if there were staff in there you'd better see them as well and talk to them as well and from the um, mobile unit being in the same place if I wanted to take a closer look I'd control the camera and, and zoom in to this degree to see um, in more detail the patient so the quality of the image you see now is filtered a lot by me taking a screenshot off my computer and then projecting it over this um, broadcast. But when I look at that, um, it's enough um, detail to be able to see nasal flaring and indrawing and that kind of stuff. All the things that we want to see as paediatricians to tell us, is this baby sick or are they not sick? Um, and that driving the camera happens um, without the need for any input from anyone else at the other end. And then if there's a clinic, um, uh, this is the clinic room in um, Greymouth Hospital, and so there's one of my patients and his family and the charge nurse sitting there having a, a clinic appointment. In a very similar way to um, the clinics that you guys do um, in and around Northland are uh, conducted. So um, I've been counting the um, consultations that I do by telemedicine over the last um, three odd years, and these are the numbers. Um, so you can see that the bulk of the work that I do by telemedicine is um, uh, outpatient follow-up visits. And um, that number of 214 is about 10% of all my follow-up patients that I now see by telemedicine, which means that all of that time that I've spent seeing them is time that can be used for a new patient appointment when I'm actually on the coast. When there's kids in the ward, um, sometimes um, there isn't an SMO there in the hospital. Um, or the kids are a bit complicated and they want me to see them and so we do a ward round of the kids in the ward and um, 66 uh, of the patients seen like that. 44 patients seen acutely, so when they're presented somewhere on the coast and they're undifferentiated and the person who's a non-pediatrician is trying to figure out what's wrong with them and what to do. And, um, uh, and in a particular, um, in a few cases, it's been extremely useful to help make those decisions because that's what people find difficult. They don't find um, doing the examining and doing the procedures difficult. They find it difficult to actually decide uh, what to do next. There's a couple of more specific things that we do less often and um, so occasionally children and family ask us to review some injuries and we've figured out a way to do that without the children having to be brought to Christchurch. And then when we've been discharging um, complex patients from Christchurch back to the coast, and we want to have an MDT so that um, all the care is transferred in a coordinated way, we do that too. So for me, 300-odd um, uh, consultations over the last three years. There's other pediatric work going on as well. So our dietitian um, lives in Christchurch, works for the coast, and she sees her patients, most of them by telemedicine. And the neonatal retrieval team um, can see patients they're going to pick up. But that is really just... Um, um, real small change and it's only scratching the surface um, of what the total potential telemedicine is and you guys will know from how systems are set up um, that um, the big money comes from adult medicine so a wee while ago what we did um, is we looked at uh, the number of patients who come to a follow-up appointment in Christchurch who have traveled from more than 45 minutes away um, across all services 
and each year that's 100,000 people. So these aren't the people who live in Christchurch City, these are the people who live around Christchurch or who come from other DHBs, um, um, and that, that's 100,000 people a year doing a fair bit of travelling. Um, so you can see that the potential is huge. Um, so what we've done, um, I guess, is to try and understand why we hardly see any patients by telemedicine. And um, there's a lot of reasons for this, and they're different in different places, but um, I think one of the really uh, big reasons is that we don't actually understand very well what the benefit to patients is of being seen by telemedicine because we don't uh, measure it, we don't ask them. But what we did, um, and you won't, you won't be able to see, I don't think, the detail on the slide, but I'm going to talk you through it. So what we did in Christchurch was we, um, or not we, the people in decision support, started mapping outpatient clinics. And they've developed this um, map that um, puts the patient on the map, the patient clinic visit on the map, puts a dot where the patient lives, and then measures in minutes of travelling time how long it took for that patient to get to clinic and get home again. Um, and then we've also put on the map a whole lot of actual or potential places that could have telemedicine capacity, and the map measures um, how far the patient would have travelled um, if they were seen by telemedicine. So um, here I mapped um, six months' worth of paediatric clinic appointments for Canterbury DHB, and uh, that's 8,300 um, clinic visits or 500,000 um, minutes of travelling time for those patients. If they all got seen by telemedicine, they would save 300,000 minutes of travelling time, and that's about 5,500 hours. Um, now, I, I'm not saying that every patient can be seen by telemedicine, um, but um, I see 10% of mine, my follow-up ones, by telemedicine, and I don't think that's an unreasonable number. So that's a huge amount of time that people will take to come and see us. And I guess if you all think about your clinics and think about um, the times that you don't examine a patient or don't need to, uh, just talk to them, that would be a fair proportion of, of um, your clinics as well. And um, I think if we, if we start to try and use that as a driver for thinking about what the um, potential for telemedicine is, um, we take into account something really important and we potentially um, give all the benefit to the patients. The other thing that, um, uh, that comes into telemedicine and I think is a reason that it's hard to get it going is that logistically it's actually quite difficult to run a telemedicine clinic. And fundamentally you need to book two places and two pieces of equipment for that patient to be seen. And um, the systems we use for patient administration don't manage that very well. Um, so the other thing that's going on in um, Canterbury and in fact the South Island at the moment is um, that there's a, a new patient administration system or it's, it's called the Patient Information Care System I think um, being developed for the South Island and we've asked whether um, um, built into that can be the capacity to book a telemedicine clinic so to book two places um, with the right equipment in them for a, a one clinic visit. Um, and I, we're hopeful that that will happen because um, I guess like Steve was saying, it doesn't matter um, and it's not difficult to have bits of technology to do this work. What is quite difficult is getting people to start doing it and then getting it to run really smoothly and be seamless. Um, in that regard, I just, um, just uh, in the last couple of minutes, what I wanted to mention was the work of the New Zealand Telehealth Forum. And so, um, I'm the chair, but um, Roy and um, Will are both uh, on the forum as well. And um, Stephen uh, hopefully will soon be on the forum to keep talking about it. Um, and um, um, so I guess to, just to give you some idea that there is a, there is a uh, I suppose, some degree of a national approach to telehealth. Um, the New Zealand Telehealth Forum is an offshoot of the National Health IT Board. And we've got about 20 members from a variety of organisations across the country um, and I guess the, um, the role of the forum overall is to promote the use of telehealth and um, um, very non-specific broad thing but that's what we're trying to do in a number of different ways and so 
recently some of the things we've been working on um, are trying to get a snapshot of what's happening around the country. So um, all DHBs have just been asked to complete a stock take survey. They won't tell us exactly what's happening, um, but it will give us a much better view than we've ever had before about um, what is going on in a number of different DHBs. And I think um, we'll find that, that Northland is one of the standout um, DHBs in the country. We have been involved in trying to develop um, and have input into other people developing standards, and those include, uh, I guess, the Medical Council of New Zealand advice to, to doctors about using telemedicine, but also standards around um, um, the equipment and the technology that's used. We've been concentrating fairly hard for the last year on the problem of interconnectivity. So um, in the country at the moment, there are three or four network providers um, in health providing video conferencing, and at the moment, it's not um, an easy thing to do to call a, a unit on a different network. Um, so um, we're trying to get those guys together with us to solve that problem because um, in a lot of ways it's ridiculous really that uh, it's complex. From my point of view, I can handle the concept of making a call on a telephone. Um, I don't understand how it works and I don't really want to understand, but I want to be able to make call each time I do. And we should have the same with video if we're going to expect people to use it in their day-to-day -day work. We do try and keep abreast of what's going on in the country, and particularly if there's anything national. And so um, recently we've um, had a bit of input into the national program that the prison service is developing. So that they want to find a way, if they can, to not bring prisoners to hospital for outpatient appointments because of all that involves. And so we're trying to make sure that as that happens, um, it happens um, in a uniform way for the, for the country. And then if we um, can provide some, we try and provide a bit of guidance. And we're also trying to um, develop some guidance for the use of, of uh, telemedicine. In terms of, well, I is the future for telemedicine, I don't, I don't see this. I think um, uh, that would be um, a terrible thing to see a child come in with Google Glass on the clinic. Um, but what I do um, hope is that before too long, every day, in every DHB, um, some patients are seen by telemedicine. And I think that a realistic goal is for 10% um, of our follow-up clinic patients to be being seen by telemedicine across the country, with that being an average, with it varying across services in different places. Um, but I don't think that that's um, unrealistic. And then I think, um, um, because of all the reasons that Steve has explained to you, we're going to see uh, a lot more telemonitoring, and I hope we do, um, as a way of taking the DHBs out into the community. Thanks very much. International and John International, you know, and I, I, you know, I want to thank you both very much for for giving us that perspective because there's a there's a heck of a lot happening on the telehealth front. Um, um, you know, I mean, telehealth's been around since as long as the, the telephone really, um, and uh, I've been doing the role I'm doing as as program manager for the last three years. So um, um, between Northland and, and Canberra DHB, we are actually essentially leading the country in terms of development of telehealth. Um, so I mean, I want to thank the, the organisation here for, for having the vision and, um, and, and, and uh, creating a role like mine and, and uh, you know, to pull the bits together to, to get the technology and the, the, the clinical networks, you know, set up and in place um, and, um, you know, engage with the clinicians and, and um, uh, you know, actually start doing some of this work. But as I say, that you know, the picture's very much changed and, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, the likes of, um, uh, a few weeks ago we had Waikato DHB come and visit us. We, there, there was had a, a strategy signed off and um, some money approved and, and they came up here for a visit to see to see how we do it, to take it back, back to their environment. Um, uh, Central DHB was here recently too because they are, they are putting in a, um, 
uh, a link between the three ICUs and they want to see how we're doing it because we've got a, a project um, underway with, uh, around acute care. So not only are they coming to us, but of course that's working in reverse too. We're very interested in what else is happening around the country. So these are fantastic opportunities as these, as these areas are being linked up for um, knowledge sharing, information sharing, and there's definitely no use in reinventing the wheel. You know, we're, 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 we're all in this together, and there's, there's a lot of synergies, um, uh, you know, not just for secondary care, but, you know, across primary care as well. We've got, you know, Mayo Plenty are doing some really interesting stuff at the moment with uh, linking up GP clinics and um, uh, uh, around the East, East Cape and um, Matakata Island and places like that. So, you know, we're feeding that back through to, for example, the proposal that's underway at the moment for um, uh, funding from the uh, Murray Development Fund for the, uh, the NGOs up here. So um, there's a lot of really interesting kind of synergies starting to happen. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, in a sense, this is, this is our vision for the DHB, um, for telehealth here, to provide a seamless and reliable service which looks and feels like clinical care. So I mean, in theory, there should be no different difference to when a patient walks into, whether it's Kautaia and a specialist is in Whangarei, or a patient's in Whangarei and a specialist in Whangarei. You know, in theory, it, it, sh it should be seamless, and that's what we are aiming for. There's a lot of bits and pieces that need to be pulled together to make that happen, absolutely, and we, we still, you know, the, the last three years of development have taught us a heck of a lot, and there's still a way to go, but, you know, we have um, made some, you know, I think some, some very, very worthwhile progress. Um, the, the, the main work streams that we've, we've got here are, are outpatient clinics. Um, last year we had 350 um, patient consultations, um, mostly to Kataia, but also to the likes of um, Daewoo and Bay of Islands hospitals, um, also methadone clinics up to uh, Kaikoi and Kaitaia. Um 350 consultations out of um, around 20,000 uh, uh, people or, or outpatient visits from outside the Whangarei region that occur every year is still small, it's a drop in the bucket, but it is a start and what we have really made a good start at is developing our clinical networks and getting the expertise and the support in place so as we grow we'll be more able to um, leverage off that, that solid foundation. So um, uh, also for the acute care area where um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, linking up the, um, the five North and five treatment centres um, and also to our ICU and also back to the Auckland ICUs. So we've started piecemeal, we've started with the pilot in Dargaval, linking up the, uh, the GP clinic there who provide after hours um, support for the uh, emergency room at Dargaval Hospital. Um, that two month pilot is underway at the moment. Um, uh, from there we'll link the AAU room to ICU. We've got a, a, an interesting project coming up with um, Kataia where uh, we'll be using some uh, equipment supplied by the University of Queensland and that will provide a uh, basically a mobile telehealth unit for um, Kataia ED and also um, for ward rounds. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, Cancer NDMs, there's a, there's a regional initiative on at the moment to upgrade um, all the multi cancer multidisciplinary um, locations and that will be finished in the next six weeks and basically what that will enable is dual content streams or sharing of PACS images during the session so basically a, a, a better and improved flow of information to, to assist with the, uh, the clinical discussions um, and also there's the primary care initiatives too so um, particularly around the Northern Health Services Plan um, um, telehealth uh, is identified as a key enabler of that, uh, and um, you know, uh, um, basically providing access to services um, to primary care is one of our key goals. So um, there is a there is a lot happening, a lot a lot, um, a lot in the vision and a lot in the plan. These are our our locations. So essentially, when you talk about telehealth, I mean. We're, we're using this video conferencing unit here, and at times it can be absolutely no difference in the, in, the, in the technology, the physical technology. It's really about the intent of use. So most of these locations here, some of them are, 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 are big BC units on carts, but others are small desktop units. 
in a, in a clinic room setting. Um, I'll show you a picture of one of those in a second. Here's, here we go. Here's Rob. He's an orthopedic clinic. Um, you'll see he's got, he's got his concerto on the left. He's got a uh, PAX image, and then on the right-hand side screen, he's talking to Chris Bounty, who's the outpatient's person for Tyre. So he's got all the information he needs at his fingertips. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's an integrated solution. And so that's why also that, you know, the developments in, in, and focus on e-health is, is very important um, and a critical, and where telehealth definitely forms part of that picture. Um, you know, the e-referrals, um, the e-prescribing, you know, all these things are actually part of the, of the bigger picture, which, which telehealth is just part of. So here's a, here's a view of um, the most uh, last year's um, consultations. Um, most of these were two kotaia, but we had around 350, as I said. Um, six of our major specialties do um, telehealth clinics. And I know you can't see the detail there, but we have achieved quite a quite a breadth of um, um, capability. So once we set up these clinics, we have then got the, you know, the, the booking clerk support, we've got the uh, nursing support in place, we've got the, 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 um, the process for appointment leaders going to the patients, etc. Um, that's all in place for these clinics to, to start. Once we've got that, we can then leverage off that and it's much more simpler and streamlined. Here's a picture of the, um, the unit that we're looking at putting into Kaitaia. With this opportunity is um, University of Queensland assisting us with the research um, evaluation. Um, we've basically been given the, the gear for free for two years and then a published evaluation after that will be done. So it's a tremendous opportunity for us to uh, uh, learn whether this can be of benefit but also um, uh, well, I guess that's the, I guess that's the main thing. I mean, understand the benefits and from there leveraging off to um, better solutions in future. So that's a that's a view from that unit. So in terms of um, governance and um, key stakeholders, we've got um, I must sort of pay homage to Sue Wyatt, who was who was the original um, technical sponsor. Sam Bartram starts in a couple of weeks. I think that his periphery is on uh, on Monday um, and. Um, Wallace Weiris is the uh, Telehealth SMO, we've got the Stephen, as you saw before, Roger Tuck, uh, District Hospital Office Managers, Nita and uh, Jen, very key players in this. Um, they very much make things happen out of the district. Um, myself, of course, also um, Neil Benny, who's now picked up the sponsor for the integration program of work coming off the uh, uh, Northern Health Services plan. So this, um, yeah, it's it's a, you know, a combined effort. So future, I mean, I've, I've mentioned pretty much most, most of this. I mean, John mentioned about also the integrated networks. You know, very important is our future of um, the ease of technology, ease of access, ease of use. You're sitting there with your iPad, you're sitting there with your, with your, with your PC or screen, and you can call whoever in the country that you need to. Not just in Northland, not just in the DHB, across networks, down country, it should be that simple. Okay, um, thank you very much to all three, and it looks like Walla wants to go first with the well, questions. Not only <laughs> an initial question, but actually just to back at what Roy was saying, and to um, thank John when he was saying that Northland and Canterbury are sort of coming on, on side I think we need to actually recognise it's the other way around. It's actually thanks to Canterbury that Northland are born, yeah. and equally the importance of having a key individual in IT who's willing to go out there and be alongside the clinicians and to um, push the clinicians forward, shall we say. I think you know, Roy's done an excellent job of that. Um, in terms of the funding idea, I think something that you showed, Steve, quite nicely, the Queensland picking up, a lot of that was courtesy of federal funding going, if you do a teleconference, teleconsultation, we'll give you a thousand dollars. So a lot of that was started by the Queensland government, recognising telehealth was an important thing. The issue, I know in some places in Queensland, it's sort of 
stumbled a bit because they do one, get the money and go, ah, not interested anymore. But the, the ones you did recognize were really good. The issue here will be, again, part of the system that John was saying of having the patient system in place, it needs to be recognized by central government that we actually do need funding for this because it does require not only two rooms, but you require two people, not necessarily a doctor at each end, but you certainly need a doctor and a nurse. You need someone with the patient at the other end, otherwise it's daunting enough. Um, and so that funding, I think, the, uh, the telehealth forum is sort of moving or pushing that in terms of the, the government level as well. So that, again, needs to, needs to be uh, recognised. Any questions that anybody would like to ask? Oh, one there from Lisa. Does the technology support using um, Skype so you can speak to patients in your own time? Or a similar something that the patients have to access on their Yeah. Um, the short answer is. Yeah, I mean, it, sorry, go on, John, do you want to do that? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it. it it does, and people do do that. Although um, I guess we we've always felt like we've got an obligation um, to maintain the same levels of privacy and confidentiality um, as when we see patients face to face, and it's more difficult to guarantee that with um, with Skype. And the reality for Skype is that the um, depends on what you want to do, but the quality is often um, lower. So um, most of the networks that um, that we're using are starting to offer um, cloud-based um, solutions. So essentially you send the patient um, a web address that they go to from their home computer that then allows them to join this, um, this private network and that's probably um, uh, what will happen once we, well, when, in situations where you want to actually be in the patient's home. There are a lot of variables with that in that not everyone has the same access to a suitable broadband from home and you need uh, a computer with a camera and that kind of stuff. But um, it's, um, it's a reality for a lot of people and some people are doing it. I would, um, I guess I'd discourage you from looking at Skype to do that because there are other things that would be more suitable for, for patient work. Following up with that, what are some of those other things so that we can start getting some information on? What other systems? Roy and myself have actually looked at the Java system um, trying to link in. You have to be out, unfortunately, you have to be outside the DHB network to do it because it, within the network, the firewall sort of <coughs> flunks you a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does provide a, fit, a relatively good picture. I'd probably say better than Skype. Yeah. The issue that we had was probably a, a technical one. Both of us yeah. couldn't quite see each other that easily. <laughs> what, but what, that was more. Yeah, what we've problem. got. <laughs> what we've got is an interesting situation mm -hmm. because um, um, technologies which provide the easier access are being implemented now in the HBs around mm -hmm. the country. So we are getting. Um, we will be getting a ringside seat of how it is done or how they go with that. So, for example, Waikato who just had the, their funding approved. Um, they're getting um, a Java system which is integrated into their network. It will be able to be, uh, it's also cloud-based, so it will be able to be used out in the primary care area, um, at homes, patients' homes potentially. I don't know exactly what I'm thinking that, but that's potentially. But also um, utilize um, tablet and smartphone technology. So they are redesigning their network architecture with that in mind. We've come along with, we've got a network and inside of that, we've got a VC network. So we're kind of within that constraint at the moment. But the future, you know, we're talking with the Health Alliance teams about this. We're looking at what's happening around the country in particular. You know, we are well placed to leverage off what has been done around. And some of the interconnectivity issues that both John and Roy have mentioned, and they're just too nice to say it, but the issues actually in terms of the connectivity are held within the companies, and it's very much a dollar sign attached mm -hmm. as to the issues of interconnectivity. It can be done. It's just vested interests 
don't necessarily want it done. Yep. The limitation is not the technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Were there any examples in the, um, I suppose, 44 Q cases that you saw where you felt that perhaps telehealth didn't allow you to treat as you would have, if, obviously, if you were there, and it's better than nothing, but if something does go wrong in the telehealth setting and you're not able to deliver the care, you know, in terms of following up with an action plan that you've done in the acute setting, um, where's the liability lie, and especially for procedural intervention, etc.? Um, so, I mean, I guess nothing ever does go wrong on the West Coast in Canterbury, and um, <laughs> uh, it makes it difficult to to answer your theoretical question, but <laughs> the um, advice I see, and the way I talk to the guys about it, is that when we're having a consultation by telephone or by telemedicine, we're sharing the responsibility, um, and um, when we do it by telemedicine, it's much easier for me to provide them with good support because I can see what they can't describe, and um, they can talk to me whilst still doing stuff. So, so if something's hyper-acute, then um, if you have to, to take the mask off and go away and use the telephone to get some advice, that's not good. If you can stand there and do all that and talk to someone, um, um, it's good. And so um, the view of the medical council, which um, is sometimes where that question leads, is that uh, if telemedicine is used to enhance a service that um, uh, it's great and they support that, they don't, they quite rightly don't want to see it um, being used as a way to replace a particular, an in-person service that could be delivered. And um, and we um, we don't do that. It's just a reality that there would never, there will never be a paediatrician living on the West Coast, just like there will never be an interventional radiologist, um, and that kind of thing. And so we're, we're trying to add something in to what we do in the old fashioned way by phone um, it is a bit, um, it's a bit scary if you can see something happening and you think if I was there I'd step in. But for, for properly, um, I suppose, serious situations, it is ideal to have someone with an overview who can't actually be drawn in to start touching the patient to keep things going. And that, that would be the ideal form of resuscitation, if you like. Pretty much over time, but maybe one more of this. Um, when can we all start talking to each other on iPads and uh, desktop computers through the DHP? <laughs> when, the, when the DHP funds it. <laughs> Great answer. Okay. Um, good. Look, um, thank you very much, all of all three of you, for a, a very informative and, and interesting discussion. And um, I'm sure everybody will want to just show their appreciation again. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.